science and psychology. When studying people, there are certain things that can be easily measured and certain things that are harder to measure. For example, how many frequencies can the human ear hear? That's relatively easy to measure because we can test and find responses and people will tell us whether they hear something or not or if it changes or if there's just noticeable difference. But how do we measure something like love? Well, the first thing we have to do is something called operationalize it. And that means put it in a definition that can be measured. For example, if we were going to measure love, we might measure something like how many times do two people kiss or how much time do they spend in, the same, in each other's company. That way we can make tally marks and discover, well, two people who don't spend any time at all together, maybe they're not in love and maybe they are. So we make our measurement, do our study, publish our results, and then wait for somebody to come along and do a better study. And eventually, we'll narrow down the field that we're looking for and come up with something that could be used as a measurement tool to determine whether two people are in love. Still, it's a very difficult prospect. In fact, so far, the only thing we've been able to do is tell when people aren't in love. For example, what we've discovered is in a relationship, the only real determiner in whether a relationship is going to fail is what researchers have called shows of contempt. For example, cutting people off when they're talking or rolling the eyes, that kind of thing. Shows of contempt turn out to be the only factor that's correlated to an actual ending of a relationship. People can scream and the relationship can still go on and on. Shows of contempt means that the relationship is on the outs. Now, if there's one thing we've learned from research into people is that people can be harmed by psychological research. For example, well, John Watson and Little Albert, for one, but the Nazis, for their example, did all kinds of atrocious things in their experiments on humans. Now, technically, the Nazis didn't consider Jews to be humans when they experimented on them, so they felt this ethical okayness about it that the rest of the world did not. But what it comes down to is, people and animals can be harmed by psychological research. So what we've done since World War II is develop a set of guidelines into how we can treat our participants. And one of the recent changes is that they used to be called subjects. They're no longer called subjects. Now they're called research participants. But there are reasons why psychologists should treat their participants ethically, with respect. For example, a psychologist who does studies and doesn't respect the participants, well, they're not going to have participants in the next study. But also in psychological research, if something harms a participant, the participant has rights. They can sue the institution that the researcher works for. These are reasons why institutions who support psychological research usually develop an, what's called an IRB board, an institutional review board. And they have to evaluate and approve any research that goes on in their institution to determine whether any particular research study is worth covering legally or putting the name and reputation of the institution on the line for a research study. So what they do first is they determine, is any potential harm outweighed by any potential benefit? So what researchers need to do before they even begin anything that has to do with research is they fill out what's called an IRB. It's a form given to the Institutional Review Board to covers what previous research has said leading up to this study, what they hope to gain, uh, all of the methodology, as in how they're going to conduct the study, what happens after the study, what they do with the research results, and there's a few things that are universal to each IRB that's submitted. First of which, research participants need to have what's called free choice. They need to be able to quit at any time. Once they begin, they should be free to leave for no reason if they want to. And they need to be made aware of this. And they need to show that they've been made aware of this. So every participant in every research study needs to fill out what's called an informed consent page. And in that informed consent page, it's essentially their bill of rights for when they're in this research study. It outlines the purpose and methodology of the study, what's going to happen, what's expected of the participant, and what's expected of the researcher during the study, what the study's actually studying, and there's also certain rights that every participant needs to be made aware of that they have. For example, anonymity. Sometimes psychological research has embarrassing results. And so when psychologists are conducting these, these research, what they do is they take the person's name out of the publication, out of the research study, and replace it with either a code name or a number. So that when the data is published and made available to the public, this person's name isn't anywhere associated with their results. That's the standard. Also, participants are allowed to ask any questions that occur to them during this process. 
and researchers are required to inform them truthfully, with one exception. If the study involves some form of deceit, that needs to be in the IRB, but does not necessarily need to be made aware to the participant until after. Because one of the rights the participant has is after the study, they need to be debriefed, which is told everything that they found out. What happened, how they did, how their tests were scored. As part of the debrief, if there was deception, that's when the participant will find out about it. And this is done so that psychologists can be trusted. Because if a study wraps up and the participant doesn't know what happened and finds out about the news, it's going to damage the name of the psychologist and the institution that conducted the study. So what we want to do is make sure that everything is above board. And if we do have deceit in a study, because sometimes it's necessary that the participant doesn't know what's going on so that their responses are more authentic, they find out about it in the least embarrassing manner possible. And also on the IRB would be contact information for the researchers and generally speaking the results from research have to be kept in a secure location for a certain number of years before they're destroyed just in case something comes up later that needs to be clarified with the data. After which time the data is usually destroyed and any connection to the participant is gone. And that's about it for IRBs. They're absolutely necessary, they can be very very long, but it's very important to develop that trust between a researcher and the participants.